everybody. Um, yeah, this video is about the fallacy of relative privation. Uh, if you've not heard of that, here is a montage of various assholes on YouTube using the fallacy of relative privation. I got really like angry and excited and like activisty. Annoying activism about first world problems. About no more first world problems. Oh please God, no more first world problems. I can't handle any more of them. Dear Muslima, stop whining, will you? Yes, yes, I know you had your genitals mutilated with a razor blade and <sighs> don't tell me yet again. I know you aren't allowed to drive a car and you can't leave the house without a male relative and your husband is allowed to beat you and you'll be stoned to death if you commit adultery. But stop whining, will you? Think of the suffering your poor American sisters have to put up with. Only this week I heard of one. She calls herself Skeptic. And do you know what happened to her? A man in a hotel elevator invited her back to his room for coffee. I am not exaggerating. He really did. He invited her back to his room for coffee. Of course she said no. And of course he didn't lay a finger on her. But even so. And you, Muslima, think you have misogyny to complain about. For goodness sake, grow up, or at least grow thicker skin. Richard. I like to use words like oppression to mean things like this, or words like patriarchy to describe cultures like this. To use the word patriarchy to describe situations like this. Mario! Millie reduces the word to a trivial level of First world problems. Number four. Hundreds of thousands of people die every day from causes far worse than bullying. Where are their stories? I posted this image to my Tumblr a few days ago. It's a picture of myself, looking rather angry, holding a sign reading, I am the other hundreds of thousands of people who died today other than Amanda fucking Todd. This image has raised the ire of folks like P.Z. Myers, who labeled me a sociopath because of it. Well, I wish I were a sociopath. I wish I were a sociopath so I could join the likes of the pseudo-moralists in hoisting Amanda Todd over those who also died on October 10th from things like starvation, war, lack of clean drinking water, preventable diseases, and other such things. It is, of course, sad that a teenage girl was bullied into taking her own life. But it's a small problem in comparison to the fact that about 25,000 people die every day of hunger or hunger-related causes, according to the United Nations. When is the last time you heard the name of a person who died of hunger? When is the last time that just one of those 25,000 people who die of hunger or hunger-related causes every day was given the international stage? There's something else that really bothers me about the use of the word troll to describe garden-variety misogyny. It suggests that this is an internet problem rather than a society problem. <laughs> It is an internet problem, to the extent that it's even a problem, not a society problem. The reason it's not a society problem is because uh, you're in Toronto, which is a first world country where uh, women are given equal protection before the bar of law. And uh, as such, you probably were allowed to you were probably allowed to travel to that uh that event, that convention center, and give your speech without getting the approval or uh, of your husband or being escorted by a man. And uh, I would even go so far as to bet that at that venue you're speaking at, there are security measures in place to make sure that no one harms you. Uh, the people, the event was not. Um, in any way, shape, or form challenged by the local government because there would be women speakers. Uh, all of that would indicate that you do not live in a society where this is a problem. The women who experience real 
societal systemic misogyny on a day-to-day -day basis are not getting up on uh, various internet forums and uh, platforms like this and uh, espousing how oh so horrible it is that they encounter rude comments on the internet. The women who are really living in societies that could be defined as rape culture, that could be defined as misogynistic, as patriarchies, those women, we don't hear from them because they are by and large uh, veiled from head to toe, kept inside and uh, under constant threat of uh, assault, dismemberment, uh, rape, uh, violent uh, punishment, mutilation. You're, we're talking, you know, there is. Uh, we're talking about a world where uh, young girls get shot for trying to go to school, where a woman gets her nose cut off and she's left to bleed out and die, where uh, a where if a woman's raped, she gets lashes because she was she tempted the man into raping her. That is misogyny. That is patriarchy. That is rape culture. And you have the gall to get up here and pretend that because assholes on the internet aren't being nice to you, you're somehow uh, you're somehow at fault. I mean, they're somehow at fault, or you are somehow being mistreated. I should say you are being mistreated. You are encountering some grand problem. She describes in her own words this experience how how she was politely asked if she would like to join someone for coffee as a bad experience uh so i walked to the elevator and a man got on the elevator with me and said don't take this the wrong way but i find you very interesting and i would like to talk more would you like to come to my hotel room for coffee um just a word to the wise here guys uh don't do that for saying this, she was deluged with abuse on Twitter. In response, her supporters set up a program that monitors and blocks a shared list of abusers. This was the very epitome of first world problems. Yeah, so in case you haven't figured out what it is I'm referring to from having watched that, um, yeah, the fallacy of relative privation is where you say such and such a problem is irrelevant because I've identified another problem which is worse than the problem that we are currently discussing therefore we should stop discussing the problem we are currently discussing and supposedly start discussing this worse problem although what you'll note about all the people there is they don't really actually have any concern for the, pro the worst problem they're bringing up they're using it as a distraction rather than uh, actually showing any serious concern for it now it's so yeah it should be pretty obvious to people why um the fallacy of relative privation is um a very silly way to argue um most of the clips there if not all are f uh, sort of anti-feminist clips but you argue when it, whatever it is you're arguing against it's not a good idea to use logical fallacies this particular logical fallacy um, is the one I find the most tiresome coming from this particular corner of the internet. Um, yeah, if you're going to argue, try and argue without using logical fallacies. would be a good idea. Um, similarly, I mean, even if even if we look at these, even if we allow these guys this logic, even if we apply their own logic, um, if you look at the things they actually seem to care about, the things they get all worked up into a froth about. It's things like video games and how feminists are supposedly taking away all their video games and how scary and terrifying a concept that is. Um, is that really, guys, what you think a third world problem is? Do you think that is, of all the problems you could be holding up, you know, as, as a, a serious problem, that's the one you've chosen? that supposedly people are trying to take your video games away. Um, to me, doesn't seem very likely. Similarly, I mean, if you, you're, let's say you're one of these Gamergate people and you're sincere about trying to um, improve ethics in gaming journalism, I mean, you see, I could use the fallacy of relative privation and I could say, well, what about 
countries that aren't democratic, they don't even have a free press. Why don't you focus on that first? And whatever reason you're not going to, you kind of get the point, don't you? You get that we don't really deal with problems in order of severity. You know, that's one of the factors we dig into account. If we have some kind of graph, um, you know, we'd have severity going on one, but we'd also have ease ease of addressing it. How, how easy is it to address this problem? How immediate is it to us? You know, a problem that's immediately nearby is a lot easier to address than one that's happening uh, 6,000 miles away. Um, also, if it's only a small problem, it, chances are only a small amount of effort, we can get it solved very quickly and move on to a, a more serious problem. So there's a lot of factors we take into account when we're deciding what problem we're going to look at first, aren't there? So to say this problem's worse, therefore everyone should be dealing with it, except for us, we're just going to point it out. That's the <laughs> seems to be the anti-feminist logic. Um, yeah, it doesn't really work. Um, other thing I would point out is there are groups such as the Global Fund for Women, which is a feminist organisation which does address um, women's issues in the third world. And also Amnesty International did launch a campaign a number of years ago uh, for the Stop Violence Against Women campaign. So they are uh, feminists working within uh, groups like Amnesty International seeking to help uh, women in the third world. So this argument Oh, the uh, Western feminists don't really concern themselves with uh, third world issues. Well, they actually do. So this argument is flawed on a number of levels. Something else I would like to point out to all the guys whose clips I've used here. Paul Elam, that guy you all seem to think is a, is a swell chap, is a lovely guy. Um, he actually doesn't agree with you about this he thinks that in iran and he has an article on the a voice for men website he thinks in iran women are privileged that's right he's he actually thinks that and there is an article on his website making that claim so what do you have to say about that anything at all anyway let me know what you think everyone goodbye